We are complex people. Our smiling faces or seemingly put together lives can hide layers of anxiety, depression, and grief. It takes shape in our minds, hearts, and bodies in different ways and at different times. Whether you face daily anxiety, numbing depression, or consuming grief, you aren't alone. So let's talk about it and create space for others to do the same. Good morning, Willow. How many of you are excited to be in church today? Yeah. That's good. Uh, we have been looking forward to this series for a long time. We're talking about anxiety, depression, and grief in this series. And you say, well, what are you excited about? Well, I'm excited because everybody that I talk to says, oh, I've got a friend that I know could benefit from this series. And so I really believe that this is, though the topics can be heavy, this is a series with a lot of hope. This is a series with a lot of potential to change lives, to encourage people, to give people some encouragement from God. And so I'm really, really excited that you're here at all of our campuses, online, in the room here at South Berry, and we're super excited that you are here. Now, uh, according to the Anxiety Disorder Association of America, which that's, that's got to be a fun place to work, I mean, when you think about it. Uh, I don't imagine anybody kind of said, you know what my dream is? I want to work at the Anxiety Disorder Association of America. But anyway, they say that the number one reason that people in our country will reach out to a therapist, will reach out to a psychologist or a psychiatrist is not because of issues in their marriage. It's not because of issues of depression. Uh, it's not even because of a depressing marriage, okay? It is because of anxiety. That's the number one reason that people seek help in our country. In America, the use of prescription anti-anxiety medication is up 34% since the pandemic. 34%. It's an $8.5 billion industry is anti-anxiety prescription medication. The New York Times Magazine said that some of us are actually biologically predisposed to anxiety. It's the SLC6A4 gene. And they say if you have a short version of the SLC6A4 gene that you're more prone to anxiety than the people who have the longer form of the version. And there is a simple test to see if you have that uh, form of the gene. Are you worried right now if you have the short version of the gene? <laughs> then you probably do. No, I made that up. Okay. Here's the deal. I looked up on Amazon the number of books. You just type in books on anxiety, worry, fear. There were over 100,000 books. One of my favorite books was called Peace for Busy People. Inner Peace for Busy People. And the subtitle was 52 Techniques to find peace in your life. So if you are busy shoveling the driveway, taking kids to soccer practice, getting your extra work done, making sure that you hit everything on your calendar, and you're, you're stressed out because of how busy you are, this book gives you 52 things for your to-do list to go ahead and add it. I don't think so. Like, I need a better solution. You know what? Let me ask you how you're doing. Can I do that? Can I just give you, at all of our campuses, even online, we, can I just give you a phrase and then you finish it for me, all right? Just where you are, out loud, just shout this out if you can help me out. You know what? I'm all stressed out. Yeah, exactly. You get how it works now. I'm all stressed out. I am all shook. <laughs> I'm at the end of my... <laughs> In fact, I'm thinking I'm coming un... Yep. Uh, in fact... I'm about to fall. That's good. That's good. So much so, I'm just ready to throw in the... Yeah, you guys are in rough shape, is what I'm saying. <laughs> You're in rough shape. Here's the deal. Wouldn't it be great if there was one place in your life where it was okay to not be okay? Wouldn't it be great if there was a community, if there was a place where you didn't always have to have the mask on we didn't have to always show people, you know, hey, everything's fine. But you could just be not okay, and that would be okay. 
Guys, I hope this is that place. Let me ask you, what, what are you anxious about this morning? What do, you, what do you bring in to church this morning? I had a friend tell me this week that their kid was starting high school. I said, how do they feel about it? They said, anxious. They're not even sure if they want to go, not even sure if they want to graduate from eighth grade because they're so freaked out about what it's going to be like going to high school. Do you have anything with your kids that you're anxious about? See, I find there's something about my kids that if something's wrong in their life, I just can't be at peace. And I thought that when they turned 18 and we sent them off, that that would end. It doesn't end. And I've had people older than me that tell me, you know what, and guess what, when you have grandkids, <laughs> you'll worry about them too. Do you have anything with your kids that's causing you anxiety? What about workplace anxiety? Can I just be real with you? I have had so many meetings this week about tough conversations that need to happen. I'm walking into this service today with anxiety, with an anxiousness about going into this next week of work. What about you? Some of you have heard rumors of layoffs. Some of you have heard about uh, tough conversations that your superior is gonna have with you. Some of you are dealing with workplace anxiety. Some of you have watched inflation and the way that the interest rates are gonna affect your finances or your business's finances, and it's creating anxiety in you. What about relationship issues? Your marriage. Any anxiety in your life because of that? Some of you are waiting on test results. Some of us can't get past our past. We just can't get past it. And, and, and we find that, you know, there was something that hurt us in the past or somebody said something in the past. And the truth is, is that it's created a wound that honestly, it still sort of feels bruised in that area today. We've been hurt by something. What about church hurt? Some of you have been hurt in this church. The fact that you're here today is a rebellion against anxiety, is a, is a victory, is a way for you to stand up and you say, you know what, I am not going down that easy. Some of you have been hurt even by your church. Some of you are at a retirement age and you're watching the little graphs go up or go down and you're trying to figure out how are we going to pay for everything when I stop getting a paycheck every week? Can I encourage you to go ahead and take whatever that anxiety is that you have right now and would you just bring that into this place and into this moment right now? Now, because I believe that one of the best places that you can bring your anxiety is right to the foot of the cross. I believe that that is the place where some real work can be done. And this is the place. I, 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 we even, we, we sort of got me up early so that we could do a little more time at the end of the service. I'm hoping that today you will not just hear teaching about anxiety, information about anxiety. My prayer is that you not, not even just get encouraged about anxiety. My prayer is that you will have an encounter with the living God today. And that's my prayer. And so we begin. We begin by thinking about the heart of God when it comes to anxiety. I'm going to be in Philippians 4. I want us to understand God's heart towards anxiety. I'm in Philippians 4, verse 6. He starts off this way. Paul, who, by the way, is writing about anxiety and being, having joy and all this kind of stuff from a prison cell. He has every reason to be anxious, and the first thing he says, or God says through him, is do not be anxious about anything. Now, the way that you read that could, could hinge on how you, have, how you view God, and the way that you view God could very much hinge on how you saw authority or how you were treated by authority or influences in your life as a kid. So if you had a dad who was constantly pushing you like, get over it, man, just get over it, suck it up. Or if you had a coach that just said, come on, I'm just so disappointed in your performance. Or if you had bullies in your life, you say, well, they weren't in an authority, but they had an incredible influence in your life that just sort of like every time you showed any sort of vulnerability, man, that was their place to attack. 
There are sometimes we bring that into our relationship with God. So you may look at that and bring bringing your anxiety, like starting to open up and go, yeah, I'm going to bring my anxiety to God. And the first thing he says is, Would you, do not be anxious about anything. Can I tell you what I think God's heart is right there? I don't think God's heart is deny it, suck it up, man up, try harder. I don't think that's what God is saying right there. See, when, when my kids were crying in the middle of the night and I walked in and they were afraid of the monster under the bed, I'd come in, I'd sit next to them, put my arm around them and say, hey, don't be afraid. But it wasn't this, would you just suck it up? I'm so disappointed in you. Would you just try harder? It was me going, hey, you don't need to be afraid. Don't be afraid. Daddy's here. You don't need to be afraid. And I think that's the heart of God in that moment. It's him kind of going, hey, you don't need to be anxious about anything because I'm right here. Maybe you need to hear this, that anxiety isn't a sin that God despises. Anxiety is a signal that God created your bodies in a way so that if there is something going on, if there's a threat of danger, if there's something going on that your brain perceives, your body sort of throws a spidey sense up there that says, hey, here's a signal that you might want to be ready for something. You might need to try something. You might need to relieve this or, or, or relieve this in your life. Anxiety is not a sin. It is a signal. It's like the check engine light on your car. When you see that, something needs to take place. And I also think God would say this. It's not just that anxiety isn't a sin. Anxiety isn't a strategy, at least not a good one. Do not be anxious about anything. He says that because, listen, it just doesn't work. Jesus would even say, who of you by worrying can add an hour to his life or a day to his life? It's like Jesus is saying, hey, worrying's not going to actually do anything. No one has ever worried their way to peace. And so God says, hey, get off that treadmill. You don't need to be on that anxiety treadmill. Instead, anxiety is a signal that can lead you to a real strategy. And God will go on in this verse to give us some of that. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, petition, thanksgiving, then you bring your request, your anxiety to God. That first word, prayer. It's just basically connecting with God. This idea that if you would go read the Psalms right now, you will find so many Psalms where people are on the run, afraid for their life, just, uh, just really a lot of anxiety in the Psalms, and they bring it in a vulnerable way to God. And by the end of the Psalm, because of this connection and nearness that they feel to God, they find faith. It's an incredible journey to read the Psalms and, and, and to sort of sense this uh, raw vulnerability, and then by the end of it, them sort of feeling like, but you know, the more that I just connect with God, the more I remember, man, God is good. And you can almost feel the anxiety dissipating. Dr. Caroline Leaf, she wrote a book called Switch on Your Brain. She's a communication pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist with a master's and PhD in communication pathology and a bachelor's in logopedics specializing in cognitive and metacognitive neurology. So I'm going to shoot straight with you. I don't know what all that means. <laughs> I don't really have a clue, but I think it means she's really smart. <laughs> Pretty impressive. And here's what she discovered. Quote, 12 minutes of daily prayer over an eight week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. A 12 minutes of connecting with God and next thing you know, physiologically you are changing. Physiologically things are moving and changing in your brain. That makes sense to me. When I connect with God, things begin to change. I was at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's where they do the, some of the NASCAR stuff. Now, my parents were from Kentucky, so it probably makes sense that we were at the NASCAR thing when I was a kid. You see how that goes together. My dad brought me to the NASCAR uh, event, and I remember I was like four or five years old. I remember walking with my dad, and there was this big rush because the, the race is about to start and there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And I'm like four or five years old, so I'm like knee high, I'm waist high. My dad is, is taller and he's going with the flow. I'm holding on to my dad's finger, not even his whole hand. My dad just, 
just had these like sausages for fingers, like just big old hands, which is so funny because I have them now. My hands are now my dad's hands. But anyway, I remember just holding on to his finger because that's all I could do. And I'm walking, and it was at that moment they say, gentlemen, start your engines. And all the engines of, of the cars start up. And if you've ever experienced that, it's just this loud, like, roar that happens. And as a kid who's already freaked out, I hear that, and I'm just like, whoa. Ah! And I looked up at my dad. Was my dad freaking out because of the roar of the engines? My dad had a smile from one ear to the other side of his ear. He looked down at me like, buddy, this is the greatest thing. I'm so excited about this. I'm so glad you're there. And I just looked up at him, and because, like, he had a better vantage point. He understood what was going on better. He was stronger and could get us where we need to go. And my dad understood that when that roar of that engine happened, this was an exciting thing. And I just looked, man, he was just smiling, and I wasn't afraid anymore. Just because I was with my dad. And I think something like that happens with God. Do not be anxious about anything, but just pray. Just pray. Connect with God and get a sense that he's on the throne. And he's not even on the throne, like on the edge of his throne, kind of going like, oh, goodness, we'll see how this works out. I'm not quite sure. I got Things surprise me all the time in this universe. I'm not quite sure how to handle this. No. God is on the throne, like back on the throne with his legs crossed, just content and completely not stressed. I pray. Another word Paul uses is petition. We ask God for help. It's as if God is saying, you don't need to be anxious because I'm here. And then it's like he's saying, you don't need to be anxious because I'm able. I am strong enough to handle anything that comes your way. So just ask me. Maybe that would be comforting to you to know right now that God is able to handle everything or anything that is causing you anxiety right now. Perhaps it would encourage you to study the names of God in the Old Testament so that if you came to God right now and said, I'm lost, I am just so confused, he is Jehovah Ra, the Lord, my shepherd. If you came to God right now and said, God, I'm hurting he is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. God, I'm lonely. He is Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is close by. God, help me change. He is Jehovah Magadishkim, the Lord who sanctifies you. God, I, I don't have what I need. I don't have enough. He is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. God, I'm anxious. I am scared. He is Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. See, I believe when God says, do not be anxious, he said, man, you don't have to be afraid because I'm right here with you. You don't have to be afraid because you can ask me because I am able to handle what's going on. And then he says, Thanksgiving. Bring, bring your request with thanksgiving. I almost feel like God is kind of putting his arm around you and me and saying, you know what, you don't have to be afraid because look at all the ways that I've been there in the past. You can come with gratitude. Like, I've been faithful in your life. I will be faithful in your life. It's one of the reasons I love to journal. I love just this idea of keeping a place, writing down the ways that God has been faithful in my life. God says, do not be afraid. Do not be anxious because I am here. I am able. And I have cared about you since the day you were born. Let's go on and, and look at what else Paul says. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What you will find when it comes to anxiety is that a lot of our anxiety 
is a, 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 is, has its source in a sort of shadow or distortion of the truth. I love that Paul says, hey, don't be anxious about anything. Oh, and by the way, hey, just focus on what's true. I, I say identify what is true because it's going to help you. Now, some people can identify the source of their anxiety easily. In fact, I'll just ask you real quick at all the campuses, just, real, just kind of throw your hand up midway. If like you could say, I know the source of my anxiety, just throw it up right like, like that. Yeah. And how many of you would say, yeah, the source of my anxiety is right next to me right now. It's this guy, right? No, I'm, don't say that. The truth, the truth is, a lot of you can, can understand the source, but there's a lot of us and a lot of you that from time to time, you don't quite understand it. It's like, why is it when my kid doesn't, uh, underperforms with his grades, like maybe that doesn't get to me, but man, as soon as they're on the ball field and I get a sense that they're underperforming, man, it's like somebody just pressed a bruise on my arm. It's like, oh, there's such an overreaction in you. You just start to get tense. You just start to get, you know, amp up. Or when somebody in a workplace environment disrespects you, why do you react so much more than other people? How come other people attend, can be calm? Hey, have you ever walked into a space and felt anxious? Like there's just something about this, uh, an environment that you walk into and you go, why is my heart racing? What is it about this moment? For some of us, we would do well to try and identify what is true in the moment. Um, and, and part of that, I love that Paul says, hey, brothers and sisters. In other words, he's talking to a community of people and saying, identify what is true. One of the things that can help us identify anxiety or what is true in the midst of our anxiety is with other people. And so I will say, you know, I love the series title, Let's Talk About It. Because the truth is, is if I have anxiety, I want to talk about, hey, let's talk about it with God. And, and then also, if I have anxiety, I, I, let's talk about it with God, but it might also be helpful to talk about it with someone else. A trusted friend at church, a, a pastor, a mentor, um, a coach, a therapist, a psychologist. That's why I asked one of my good friends, Steve Cuss, um, who is an author. He wrote this book, Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and theirs. He's one of my great resources when I can't understand why my heart is beating faster. I'll call him and I'll just talk through some things with him. And he was so gracious. He's going to help us out in this series to kind of give us a little bit of an expert view and understanding of anxiety. Check this out. Well, hi, Willow Creek. My name's Steve Cuss. I'm the author of Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and Theirs. I'm also, I consider Dave and Rachel Dummett to be dear friends. I've known them for over a decade. And I love your pastors and love your staff. I've had the incredible privilege of working with your staff because I, I'm a pastor myself, but one of my specialties is helping people notice, name, and diffuse anxiety. Uh, first, always yours and then theirs. You know, oftentimes it's tempting to see anxiety in other people first, but we always pay attention to what's going on in us and then we try to help other people. Uh, Willow Creek is in this incredible series, Let's Talk About It. Just that phrase, I love that because anxiety wants to isolate us and just the simple idea that we get it out in the open. We talk about it as a church, we talk about it in our sermons, but of course, we also get into our midweek community and we get it out into the open and have a conversation. What I'll be doing over the next three weeks is just detangling anxiety, taking a look at the different forms of anxiety and helping us understand the unique characteristics of each kind of anxiety. The simple fact is, anxiety is one word that covers really broad territory. Those of you who are football lovers, the way I think about it is each type of anxiety has its own playbook. So today we will be talking about two types of anxiety, but what I'd like to briefly do is just mention the various ones we're gonna cover in the three weeks. We will talk about acute anxiety, chronic anxiety. We're gonna talk about trauma. 
We're going to talk about depression and the kinds of anxiety that require mental health medications. We'll even be touching on suicide on that one. And then we'll also be talking about grief. So as you can hear, we are not talking about anxiety. We're talking about anxieties. And if we can detangle them and understand each of them having their own playbook, each of them operating, if you will, by their own set of rules, that can help you both make sense of what you might be carrying or what might be carrying you, but also help you maybe help your loved ones, the family and friends in your life that are carrying things. So just in brief, next week we'll be really getting into trauma and depression. And then in the third week, we'll be really getting into grief. What I want to do today is talk about anxieties that are based on things that are real, things that are true. So for example, grief. Grief is a loss that happened to you and that's real and true. Uh, trauma. Trauma is an event that actually happened to you in your past and it's real and true. These are two different types of anxieties. Acute anxiety is a type of anxiety and it's that short-term anxiety that you feel anytime you think you might be in danger. So if you're ever driving on the interstate and you have to swerve your brakes uh, to get to safety, that's because your body is telling you you are in danger. If you're ever out jogging in the countryside and maybe you see a snake and, you know, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people who love Jesus and then there's people who love snakes, right? Uh, and so maybe you see a snake and, and your body reacts or even acute anxiety can happen if you ever lose your child on, on a playground. That can feel like an immediate life and death. That's also an anxiety that's based on something that's true. Now, we'll dig more into trauma next week. We'll dig more into grief in week three. The one anxiety I want to focus on today is called chronic anxiety. And chronic anxiety is fascinating because it has its own playbook. It's not based on something true. It's not based on something real. It's based on something false and perceived. So, for example, in my life, I get chronically anxious if I don't know the answer to a question. Anytime I'm in a meeting and somebody asks somebody a question, if I don't know the answer, I get filled with this thing, which is clinically called chronic anxiety. Uh, put me in a room where I've disappointed somebody or let somebody down. I'm a chronic people pleaser. And when I don't please people, I get chronically anxious. For some of you, it might be connected to perfectionism, right? Those of you who are perfectionists, you, you know who you are. You, you believe the lie that you must get it perfectly right every time, the first time you've ever done something. Or those of you who struggle with control, we colloquially call you control freaks, right? Uh, maybe you go into a meeting and you have six scenarios laid out for yourself, but somebody brings up a scenario you haven't thought about and you get defensive or combative, not because they asked or said something wrong, but because you are caught off guard. You must always be in control to be okay. These are some of the sources of chronic anxiety, and this is where we're going to spend our time today. Because a lot of people may think about themselves and say, I'm not really an anxious person. And that's because when you think of the word anxiety, you think of worry and fear. Or maybe you think of mental health medication. That category we'll cover next week with depression. But actually, chronic anxiety, every human has it in the workplace and the home place. And what it looks like is reactivity. Chronic anxiety does not look like worry and fear. Chronic anxiety looks like reactivity. So the question you can ask yourself is, what kinds of situations make me reactive? Um, actually, it was just last year I was flying home from O'Hare Airport. Uh, sorry, Chicagoans, I consider O'Hare Airport the place where Satan himself lives. It's a terrible place. And there I was at O'Hare and they canceled flights and I ended up up most of the night. And the next morning I got on my plane very early. I land home in Denver, which is where I live now. The seatbelt sign went off and the family behind me bolted up the aisle. They jumped their turn. Can you believe that? They actually skipped the line. Now, one of the ways you can discover your reactivity or your chronic anxiety or what we're saying is something you think you need that you don't really need. One of the ways you can discover that is look at your core values, what really matters to you. And when somebody 
violates one of your core values, you get flooded with reactivity. One of my core values is courtesy. I believe everyone should wait their turn. And so the teenage girl bolted up the aisle. I wasn't able to stop her. By the way, I'm not proud of this. But then I stuck my arm in the aisle and actually blocked the rest of the family from going up the aisle. I turned around, I addressed the family, and I said, hey, we're all trying to get off the plane. Let, let's just wait our turn. The family invited me to, how do we say it in church, have a relationship with my mother that I would never have. They, they told me to go to a terrible place, and they, they busted up the aisle. What was going on in that moment? Well, first of all, I was filled with reactivity because I was chronically anxious. I did not get what I believed I needed in the moment, which is for them to be courteous. What makes you reactive? Think about your precious relationships with your family, your friends, and your workplace, and the kinds of behaviors from others that cause reactivity in yourself. Here's the fascinating thing about chronic anxiety, out of all the anxieties we're talking about, it's the only one that's contagious because it's generated by assumptions and false expectations. I assume that everyone should wait their turn. I falsely expect that this family should wait their turn. And when that doesn't happen, I get filled with reactivity. Now, one of the ways you can notice reactivity is sometimes when you're filled with reactivity, you get bigger. That's what I did on the plane. I made myself bigger. I stuck my arm in the aisle. I took over. That's because in the moment, my brain got infected with the reactivity. I was no longer able to see what was really going on. This is the other fascinating thing about chronic anxiety and reactivity. It puts you in a false reality. It infects your brain. It kind of makes you drunk in the moment, if you will. Maybe you've had a fight with a spouse, or maybe you find yourself in a difficult pattern with a child or somebody at work. What's going on there is your reactivity is taking over and you've lost sense of reality. Rather than connecting to that person, you're now just more interested in winning an argument or proving your point. You're no longer listening to learn. You're now listening to defend or listening to hijack or listening to fix. Those are all evidences that when you're filled with reactivity, you get bigger. Sometimes when we're filled with reactivity, we get smaller. We become like a turtle in our shell. Rather than interrupting and getting aggressive and taking over, we go completely the other way. We, we suddenly don't feel safe to be fully ourselves. We shrink ourselves down. We become maybe like a turtle in our shell. Maybe in a meeting, you hope that no one calls on you, for example, or if somebody does call on you, you make sure to not tell them what you really think because you don't feel safe anymore. And so you end up having your own meeting after the meeting with people you do feel safe with. That can be a way of getting smaller. Sometimes getting smaller can look like charming your way out of a situation. We've seen this in the Me Too movement, haven't we? When these aggressive men are dominating these women and some of them laugh and giggle and the man doesn't understand that she's made herself smaller. She's just trying to get out. She's just trying to survive. Uh, it's fascinating, isn't it? Reactivity. You can see how it's contagious. Now, obviously, I'm a white man. Some truths are self-evident, and you won't find a whiter person than Steve. I'm so white, I'm almost translucent. But as I've worked with people of color and listened to your journeys, one of the things that's fascinating for you is oftentimes you will walk into a room and you will notice, for example, that maybe you're the only one of your kind in a room. Let's say that you are, a, for example, a black woman and you walk into a staff meeting where it's all white men. Oh my goodness, your radar is up and you are working so hard, making yourself bigger and smaller, bigger and smaller, managing that reactivity so you can stay connected. It's extra difficult to be human-sized where you're the only person of your kind in a room. So today's focus is really chronic anxiety. The, the goal is detangling this word anxiety into its parts. As we dive in next week, getting into different kinds of anxiety, where I want to end with chronic anxiety is a couple of invitations. Number one, what might be an assumption that you hold about yourself that may not be true? For example, a perfectionist or somebody who must be in control, or in my case, a chronic people pleaser. When I think about that question, I think to myself, 
I need everyone in my life to like me for me to be okay. But that's not true. I can thrive as a human because of what Jesus has done. I can actually be set free from this false need. So that's question number one. What's an assumption I have about myself that's unattainable or not true? The second question, what's an expectation that somebody might be putting on me that I'll never reach? That's how chronic anxiety becomes contagious. Somebody puts their expectation on you and it infects your assumption about yourself. And also homework this week is one of the great challenges as we talk about anxiety is learning to notice it in the moment. So some homework you might consider noticing reactivity in any group of people, but particularly noticing it in yourself. As you walk into a room, is there anybody who's the only one of their kind in a room? That person's probably working extra hard to stay human-sized. But you can also be saying, well, who's getting bigger right now? Who's getting smaller right now? And most importantly, am I catching anxiety? And am I generating and spreading anxiety? So acute anxiety versus chronic anxiety. Acute anxiety is in the moment. It's based on a real threat and it feels like life and death. Chronic anxiety, we're always carrying it. And it's not based on something real. It's based on a perceived need. But your body cannot tell the difference between the two until you train it. So pay attention to reactivity this week. And your final invitation is when you notice that you're filled with reactivity, all you have to do is get off the anxiety treadmill. It's not leading you anywhere. You can keep worrying your way to peace, but it's not going to get you anywhere. Get off the anxiety treadmill and take a breath and pause and do what the authors of scripture remind us to do. Remember the Lord. It only takes 20 or 30 seconds and then maybe you can give your activity to God, relax into the presence of God, and be human-sized and manage your anxiety. All right, that's week one. I look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I got to be honest, I think one of my false assumptions is that I would be more attractive if I had that accent, um, <laughs> that people would like me more. Um, I'm so grateful for Steve uh, in my life and really just others as well who can help me understand what's true, what's going on, and then what are healthy ways for me to move forward in, um, in, in healthy ways. Um, the last thing I would draw your attention to is in verse 7, Paul gives us, uh, excuse me, in verse 9, Paul says, whatever you have learned, received or learned from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And so where we begin is to try and understand what is God's true heart towards the things that are causing me anxiety, towards the things that are taking and robbing me of peace. And then the second, what is actually true in the moment? And is there anything false that is causing me the anxiety that I, can, that I can work through in a healthy way? And then the third, an invitation to put into practice those things that Paul would teach. And that's what we want to do uh, right now, is just to give you the opportunity to actually put into practice some of the things that the church has been practicing for a couple thousand years now. We um, believe passed out communion for you. It's a little bit of bread, a little bit of juice. And uh, Steve talked about at the very end of his video, the, uh, this idea of remembering the Lord, remembering Jesus. Um, certainly there are a lot of different ways to remember Jesus and his influence and his impact in your life. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he actually took bread with his friends and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, he said, remember me. It's a powerful thing to remember Jesus. 
and the picture that he was giving his disciples, which it had to have been in the moment kind of confusing. You see, we have the perspective post cross. We have the perspective of looking back 2,000 years and having heard the Good Friday and the Easter story probably dozens and dozens of times. But for them, they're sitting around the table with their friend and he says, body and blood and every time you eat this, remember me. He was giving them a picture of him on the cross. That in just a few short hours after being falsely accused, whipped, beaten, abandoned by friends, marched up a hill, he would be nailed, hands and feet, to a cross. His body broken, his blood poured out. And he did that for us. He did that for you and for me. And that because he was both fully God, Son of God, and fully man, because he lived a sinless life, the fact that he died on that cross and then three days later overcame death and rose again, he gives you and I the ability to overcome sin and death in our own lives. He gives an invitation to you and to me to say that if we'll put our faith in him, and come and follow him, then we need not fear anything because perfect love casts out fear. And that's the love that we experience on the cross. And that's the love that we remember and celebrate when we take communion together as a family. So you take that anxiety, that thing that you're anxious with, and you bring it in this moment to the foot of the cross, and you remember Jesus' body and his blood poured out. He gave that to his friends, to Christ followers. If you're not a Christ follower here today, um, this practice is probably meaning, probably meaningless for you. It wouldn't make a lot of sense for you. Maybe for you, it is your next step to just focus on the words of these songs. Maybe for you to, to, to not focus on the words of the songs, but to take a time and to pray over these next couple of minutes to, to just pray and to ask God, God, what is it that you're calling me to do, you know, anxiety experts will say that one of the reasons for anxiety is when we have incongruent values, when our walk doesn't match our values. Maybe there are things that you know to be true, things that you want to be true, and yet you're walking in a way that don't produce those things in your life. And so maybe for you, it's a prayer. It's saying, God, what is it that I need to do to line up with who you created me to be? We're going to have people up front in the during these songs, if you want to pray with somebody, if you want to be baptized, I've heard we got baptisms in uh, just about every campus. If you today um, want to say yes to Jesus, then you come forward and you talk to these folks and they'll help you make that decision. Maybe that's the next step that God is calling you towards today. Maybe he's calling you to bring that anxiety to him and to say yes to Jesus for the very first time. If that's true, you need to know the rest of us are cheering you on. We are praying for you. We are so excited because we remember the moment that God was calling us to come and to say yes to Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you just need somebody to pray for you. You just need to know that like what Paul said, brothers and sisters, like we need community together. I need somebody to, to, hold, me, to, to, to hold space with me. I need somebody to shoulder uh, my anxieties with me. I need somebody that can, I can lean on their faith for a few minutes. There are going to be people up front and that's literally what they're there for, just to pray with you, to talk with you, to answer questions, to help you in any way possible. So whatever your next step is, we've got a couple of songs, we've got a little bit of time today. Whether it's communion, prayer, baptism, whatever you choose, this is your time to encounter God, to take a moment with the living God. Let's take those next steps together as a family as we stand and sing together.